Hi, welcome everyone. We are excited to have you join us. On today's webinar, we'll be discussing how MQTT is used in medical laboratories to obtain real-time solutions. Laboratory technicians and researchers need real-time access to the data produced by these devices, so it's guaranteed that the equipment operates efficiently and any issues are addressed promptly. MQTT can be used in medical labs for various purposes, including real-time data monitoring, instrument control, and communication between medical devices and data management systems. This webinar will be discussing implementing MQTT-based communication. I'd like to begin by introducing our presenters. Today, we are joined by two of my colleagues, Ernest Russell and Brandon Ruiz. Ernest Russell is a technical content manager here at EMQ, working in our marketing department. He brings over a decade of experience in information technology and broadcast engineering, supporting some of the largest media companies in the world, including CNN, Turner, and Fox. Ernest has always been passionate about learning and writing, earning a master's degree in networking and telecom management. As a technical content manager, Ernest is focused on knowledge sharing and best practices for MQTT and IoT. Brandon Ruiz, with nearly a decade of experience in end-to-end -end IoT platform provider space, has assisted many OEM manufacturers and internet service providers across various sectors in their digital transformation journey. As connectivity and data demands grew, he recognized the importance of edge computing and MQTT being the definitive standard for IoT messaging. Now at EMQ, Brandon is focused on the shift from basic IoT implementation and management to its sustainable future, ensuring robust, efficient, and scalable deployments. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please note this webinar is being recorded. The webinar will be approximately 45 minutes in length, 30 minutes of presentation and discussion with the remaining 15 minutes being allotted for Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions within the Q&A tab and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Brandon. Thank you, Rosemary. Hey everyone, good morning, evening and afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us live and also on demand. Uh, we hope you're all having a great week and that you enjoyed the holiday yesterday. My name is Brandon Rees, Product Marketing Manager here at EMQ. And uh, Ernest and I are very excited to talk to you more about this topic and how you can create real-time medical lab uh, equipment using MQTT. So first and foremost, we'd like to take you through a, a you know introduction of MQTT, explain to you and give more clarity as to why we're considering it to be the de facto uh, protocol, especially in this space, followed by you know some of the main benefits and uh, values that you gain from this implementation. Then segueing into the implementation and how it can be applied to devices that are already deployed in the field and wrapping with uh, case studies and real world applications of different instances that are out in the market today. Next slide, please. Starting off with NQTT, uh, one thing that I would like to say, we'll start off with what it is, um, but just note that this is not a deep dive. Um, we do have, uh, earlier webinars or resources that we'd recommend that you uh, re refer to um, outside of this webinar to get more versed um, and a deeper understanding. But at its core, at a very high level, just to recap, uh, MQTT was originally designed and developed in the 1990s by IBM. And what it stands for, what it used to stand for, was Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. Uh, today, it's just the acronym, but it is a very lightweight publish subscribe messaging protocol. Um, that has a incredibly small um, code tr uh, code footprint on devices. And it's been optimized uh, for efficiency, which means that when you port it or load it onto devices, it's not consuming a lot of those uh, resources like processing power, energy, or memory. And more importantly, it can run very stably in, in areas where there's high traffic or where bandwidth, there's constraints, or in areas that are remote and more distributed that have uh, unstable networks. And continuing on next, what are what are the advantages in data communication that we see as a result of the protocol? And there are three that stand out, especially in, in this field. Number one is it's incredibly reliable. It is equipped to, to scale up and support large IoT deployments. And there also is broad support for various programming languages. Um, going back to the reliability of it, 
uh, through MQTT, you, you were given three different levels of quality of service or QoS. There is zero, one, and two. Zero being uh, at most once, uh, one being at least once, or two being exactly once. You also are given access to things like session awareness uh, through persistent connections. And then there's other mechanisms like keep alive, uh, which is a, think of it as an interval check to periodically you set the cadence on checking the connection of your devices. And then last will and testament is really for uh, if there is a unplanned disruption or disconnection, uh, clients will trigger notifications to notify you of the outage. And then there's also for keep, I'm um, sorry, uh, retain messages. So you're able to set this parameter to make sure that the broker holds the last uh, transmission. So that way when new subscribers join, they're not just left uh, hanging high and dry until the next message comes. They will be served the latest message. Um, so they have something in real time. So those are all things that help uh, promote and make sure ensure that messages are delivered um, in the most challenging of conditions. Um, going back to it being well suited and equipped for large scale IoT deployments, uh, the reason why is it's really due to the nature of uh, the model itself or the pattern in which it communicates. So having that publish subscribe model, it really decouples that direct connection that usually resides between uh, a device in the cloud or publisher or subscriber. And it really allows for, it really frees up the bandwidth in the network. So that's one thing that you won't have to worry about and you're able to scale up to millions of devices and, uh, Going back to the broad support of various programming languages, um, there a lot of IoT ecosystems today are very diverse um, in a number of ways, right? It, it could be multiple different uh, products within a space. It could be a scanner, it could be a pulse oximeter, um, and it can also be developed using different uh, uh, languages like uh, PHP, um, Node.js, Python, and more. And then it also, you have to consider into the different protocols that are used to communicate. And then going, proceeding on to uh, why is this relevant to the healthcare industry? So when looking at medical devices, we we'll say that there's a, a high degree of criticality among medical devices, um, whether you're talking about, you know, clinical incubators, cryostats, pulse oximeters, CAT scans, MRIs, the list goes on. Um, there's often a lot writing on the timing and accuracy of these devices, right? And would say that false or untimely readings oftentimes could jeopardize the lives or the overall well-being of patients. So um, it's something that's very serious and that uh, let's put your best foot forward and maximize with MQTT. And in most instances, when uh, looking at the medical industry, oftentimes there's thousands of concurrent connections um, across an assortment of devices, different protocols, and they're usually on these large multi-site campuses. So to be able to support uh, that diverse uh, amount of devices without any disruptions to service, um, that's where MQTT really excels and stands out. Next slide, please. And that brings us to uh, something that we refer to as EMQX, Bring Your Own Cloud. Uh, we do know that this isn't you know, necessarily a new concept in the field, but it is something that is very important and it allows you to use your own infrastructure. So instead of having to deploy yet another cloud instance and having to establish a new cloud to cloud connection, whether you're doing VPC peering on the same cloud provider, or if you're doing it across different cloud providers, which we don't recommend because you'll incur you know, additional uh, charges and latency, um, now you can deploy an EMQX cluster within your own uh, infrastructure. So let's say you're already deployed on AWS, GCP. Um, you now have the ability to launch it in your own instance. And this is, this is valuable for a number of reasons. And three come to mind. Uh, one, it allows you to truly take control of your IoT data privacy. So in a world where... Uh, Data sovereignty and compliance are really important and very critical challenges that businesses often meet. Um, instead of having to worry about the permissions and parameters around sharing data outside of your 
your core infrastructure, um, you're able to maintain things like GDPR, HIPAA compliance, and you will fully control the ownership, management, and security and privacy in your instance. Um, it's, number two, you're able to tailor your MQTT settings and configurations to align with your specific needs. So what this means is, is that you're only going to pay for the services that you use, which is great. Instead of just paying um, that recurring service fee that you would with a cloud provider that stands on its own, that is going to bill you no matter how you use it. And lastly, you're able to leverage, we do have 40 plus uh, formal system integrations with external systems like Kafka, MongoDB, MySQL, and, and many more. So this is something that is, is increasingly becoming more and more prevalent and uh, important within the healthcare space. Next slide, please. Now covering, going to the benefits. So we've talked about, uh, we've learned about MQTT and um, you learned about the different cloud options that you have. And now we're going to talk about the different benefits and really going back to the criticality of devices, being able to be served the right data on time is really important. So really being able to capitalize on real data, real time data transmission versus near real time, you know, every second counts in this space. Um, so uh, we do have, proof points of high throughput and low latency. And uh, we're able to transmit you know, up to a million messages sent, mind you, uh, or received bi-directionally per second um, with sub-millisecond latency. So that is pretty much is uh, real time as you can get in this day and age um, via cloud connection. And then for scalability and um, interoperability, um, you're able to seamlessly scale up or down depending on your, your business needs. And this can be done either horizontally or vertically. And what we mean by this is if you want to do horizontal, you're able to seamlessly add new nodes to a cluster to support the workload. And if it goes beyond that, you're even able to spin up horizontally to add new clusters to your instance to provide added support. And you can do that up or down as needed. Um, we also have, uh, you can leverage uh, auto automatic load balancing capabilities that'll help you through those different uh, peaks and low periods. Um, and with regard to uh, scalability, um, with EMQX, against a benchmark we've done internally, um, you're able to support up to 100 million concurrent connections, which we realize is probably way more than a lot of folks will need um, at this current time. But really, as the world becomes more connected and more applications are being uh, thunk up, um, this number will become pretty reasonable relatively quickly um, and needed by a lot of different uh, companies and opportunities. And for with regard to interoperability, um, there rather than having to uh, pull down devices that are already deployed in the field, we're able to tap into your existing uh, legacy devices that are already actively running. And there are devices that communicate directly to the cloud. And for those instances, you're able to handle translation or conversion at the cloud level. And for devices that don't have that capability to have that direct, uh, uh, direct connection, you're able to also deploy Neuron, which is an edge level gateway or bridge that's going to handle all of your device translations, conversions, and ultimately transmission um, out. And it's a local local deployment. Oftentimes, it could be uh, something as simple as a Raspberry Pi um, and can get that set up relatively quickly. And just to give you an idea of kind of the different uh, protocols that it will be dealing with in this space, Interfacing with things like HL7, ASTM, DICOM, and many more, which Ernest will go over in greater detail in just a moment. And uh, going on to the efficient resource and utilization. So as I mentioned at the beginning, MQTT was designed to be efficient, and it has an incredibly small code footprint, so it can be ported and loaded onto most devices or even microcontrollers. And they have very small message headers, you know, just two bytes. So 
uh, and this was done to further optimize your network bandwidth. And this is why you're able to have so many devices on the network um, at any given moment. Um, and the good part about this too is it was, it's also good for devices that are either battery operated, mobile, or have sleep modes that are trying to conserve energy. Um, so you'll see a lot of those devices in healthcare where you're moving it from room to room. So this is another good instance that will help conserve the, the battery life and the performance of your device. And uh, continuing on to remote monitoring and control, uh, what you're able to leverage uh, through MQTT and brokers is you're going to be able to have a comprehensive monitoring and optim optimization services. So you're going to be able to track the overall health and performance of your infrastructure. Um, and if you don't want to use the built-in dashboards that are provided, you're also able to you know, seamlessly integrate with uh, third-party external tools like uh, Prometheus or OpenTelemetry um, to be able to track things like metrics, logs, and traces. Um, and you'll also be able to, we'll be able to help augment and facilitate uh, device monitoring. So you could be able to see device usage, performance, be able to trigger alerts when devices need to be serviced, repaired, or replaced. And also, uh, of course, uh, pushing over the air updates to further enhance your devices in the field uh, over time. Um, and with that, I would like to hand things over to Ernest to talk to you more about the implementation and digging into the real world applications. Thank you, Brandon. That was an excellent uh, tutorial to get, get everyone started uh, with MQTT. And um, I'll, I'll just mention before I go into uh, some of the medical lab protocols that we do also support uh, MQTT-SN, which is MQTT for sensor networks. And as Brandon mentioned, those um, that protocol um, specializes in those types of devices that um, may go to sleep for certain intervals or are battery operated where you want to optimize that battery and, and only send messages in burst uh, when you need to. So let's let's talk about some of the, the popular medical lab equipment protocols and that are out there. Um, Brandon mentioned um, Health Level 7 or HL7, which is, is definitely one of the most popular. And so I'll, I'll talk more about this one uh, in particular, um, but um, it's it's integrated in many different types of healthcare systems and, and often deployed to uh, transmit uh, lab results and clinical data. Um, in in different types of systems. So um, HL7 is is up there at the top. And we also have ASTM or uh, the American Society for Testing and Materials. And they've defined several standards for data exchange in medical labs and computer systems um, to ensure that uniform communication between different types of lab equipment. And so one of those protocols that they've developed is called LAW or Laboratory Analytical Workflow. Um, and again, ensuring that um, standard communication between these different types of devices. Uh, we also have uh, DICOM, as Brandon mentioned, which is uh, digital imaging and communications in medicine. And again, another, another standard for um, storing data, but in this case, most of the time that data is is medical images when we're talking um, DICOM. Um, some um, also, also use, especially uh, some, let's, let's call it le legacy medical equipment, may use custom or proprietary protocols and direct connection protocols um, like serial protocols through RS-232, or RS-485 direct connections. And that's that's when you would need um, a, a wired connection, right, between um, that medical equipment and some kind of terminal or laptop. And more often, uh, we're seeing uh, modern equipment connected through IoT protocols like MQTT uh, and, and co-op, uh, constrained application protocol. So um, these are, are being increasingly 
use to allow uh, remote monitoring, allow connections, and, and to help with communication, um, not just between um, devices, but also between those devices and the cloud. So um, as I mentioned, um, Health Level 7 is, is definitely one of the more popular protocols. Um, and um, the current level is, uh, the current version is version 5. Um, and also um, they have a version that's called HL7 FHIR. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but it, that FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare interoperability resources. And it, it was really, again, designed for um, that communication and making sure that there's a there's a standard um, interoperable um, data exchange between different types of medical equipment. And so in, in this model, we see that, um, for instance, we have what we call an an encounter, right? So, say an encounter. Let's let's call that um, a, a visit, right? So, a doctor's visit. You go to a hospital. You go to a clinic, and there's several data exchanges that that come into play, right? We have um, data from from the patient uh, themselves. Right, so uh, may that may be an observation of, of maybe pain or complaint of of pain in their ear, right? Then we have um, observations uh, from the nurse, um, also from the doctor, um, and so in in this model, um, the asserter is that that individual who is who is providing the data, which could be an individual or could be um, a system. Um, or a, a software that's that's doing this in an automated fashion. I mean, then again, we have the performer, which in this case, let's say uh, the the doctor, right? And that's uh, the entity or system um, that is responsible for for per performing an action or prescribing. Um, so um, that um, that HL seven FHIR. A system or solution helps uh, make sure that even though data is coming from different data points, that it's stored in a common manner um, that can be communicated to different types of systems. And uh, there's there's also large implementation libraries that will will help um, in converting that data um, into data that can be used uh, for other systems or easily transmit it over, over MQTT. And so um, HL7 um, was, is FHIR uh, was actually adapted uh, by Apple in, 2000, in 2018 uh, for use on their iPhone. Um, it's also been, been tested and verified. Um, by by Microsoft and Google, so um, we we see it as a as a pretty popular protocol and um, or or um, standard, and um, it uses one of the reasons for that is it it leverages uh, some of those common web standards that that we're used to, uh, like XML and JSON. So now that we we know a little bit about MQTT and some of the popular medical protocols out there, let's take a look at some real world examples. So I'll talk about two examples here: one remote monitoring of lab equipment, and the other is data integration from that equipment to the cloud. So starting with uh, remote lab equipment monitoring, um, here you can see um, on the left that. Uh, we have a patient that's having multiple tests done. And as Brandon mentioned, um, the, the power of MQTT and the power of real-time data transmission um, can, can really help improve efficiency uh, in this workflow. And when, again, when we're talking real-time, we're talking sub-second latency. So in this case, we have different types of equipment and those could be using different protocols, but we can aggregate those that lab uh, equipment results 
and stream that data, um, send those messages over MQTT into your cloud, right? And uh, Brandon mentioned our bring your own cloud uh, version. And, and this is really becomes really important when we talk about um, healthcare and, and protecting um, data from, from your patients or from lab results, making sure that data isn't going um, outside of, of your data information requirements. So we're able to use your uh, HIPAA compliant uh, infrastructure uh, to, uh, to host your MQTT broker. And so here you see that MQTT data going into uh, your cloud, the cloud of your choice, private cloud, um, and being made available for applications that um, that you have or build for remote monitoring and diagnostics, allowing you to see again in real time your the health of your equipment, being able to proactively plan maintenance uh, and and monitoring the the status health of of that equipment. And also being able to make that data available for LIS, lab information systems, and LIMS, laboratory information management systems. And the, the difference between those two is typically laboratory information systems are more patient-centric, focusing on patient data, uh, the personal demographics and health data associated with that patient, and LIMS being associated uh, more with with samples, processing individual and black and batch samples. And so the next workflow we're, we'll talk about, which is, is much related, is that data integration from your medical equipment to lab device or to, to the cloud. And so here we, we show um, at the bottom, you can see, and you may have a diverse uh, range of, of equipment that talks over different protocols, but let's let's take that example of HL7 FHIR, which which outputs in uh, JSON or XML format. So this is a, a human readable format, um, very very common. Uh, we can parse that data. Um, bring it into uh, Neuron. I actually, uh, Brandon also mentioned Neuron, which which helps with device translation. Um, eKuiper, which which helps stream data and has a rules engine, S SQL engine to help um, aggregate and send the data that you need to your cloud. And uh, we uh, we can actually manage all three of these services for you. Um, your EMQX broker, your eKuiper instance, and Neuron. We call that our EMQX Edge Cloud Platform. And so it, it takes that, that burden off of you uh, to be able to uh, make sure that, that these products are, are licensed, managed, updated together. And we do support every, every major cloud platform and private cloud. So uh, wherever you choose to, to host, we can help you with that. So let's, let's wrap up here with um, the, the benefits and, and how MQTT helps improve and, and makes your workflow more efficient when you're talking about managing medical lab devices. For one, uh, MQTT is is particularly great with pre preserving bandwidth for small messages, and so we're talking uh, messages that that are not sending a lot of data, but very frequent, right? So so sending data very often, but not large chunks of information. So MQTT has a very small header size, which re reduces the overall overall. Um, data sent compared to um, other protocols with, with larger headers. And so um, that's one of the things that make it more efficient than um, text-based protocols like JSON or, or XML, where that data um, isn't in plain text. Uh, MQTT supports binary data um, directly embedded without additional encoding, which 
again, makes it um, a little bit more efficient when we're talking about sending a large, large amount of messages uh, in, a, in a short period of time. And so um, Brandon talked about the different QoS levels in MQTT, which can uh, really help uh, help you fine tune um, your your data flow and and reliability uh, for the messages that that you need to deliver, and just overall reduces um, make sure as we scale uh, from not just thousands to millions of of devices, and and we benchmark our our broker cluster um, to handle. Um, a hundred million, you know, devices. So, um, again, like Brandon said, do you need that now? No, but we uh, we give you um, that that platform to be able to to scale reliably. And so, um, that uh, that being said, um, we there are many different um, protocols that um, that you can choose for this, but uh, we we really believe that MQTT. Um, is the future as far as as protocols for medical lab devices um, that that communication um, at large scale and being able to deliver reliably even if the uh, the network is is not that great or um, and making sure that we reserve bandwidth for for other data um, that's that's flowing through your network and. Uh, that being said, we're we're right at time, and uh, Rosemary, I think we're we're ready for some Q and A. All right. Well, I wanted to go ahead and first start off by thanking you, Ernest, as well as Brandon, for such an insightful discussion today. Hopefully, you guys have enjoyed it. And like you said, uh, it is time for Q and A, so it's not too late to go ahead and submit those questions in. Um, during the presentation, we did receive um, a handful of questions, so I will go ahead and start with asking those. And like I said, if, if you have any additional questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A tab. Um, all right. The first question that we got was, um, does the EMQX MQTT broker support handling and forwarding HL7 messages natively? Um, I'll tackle that one, uh, Rosemary. Um, and, and the answer is not not natively, right? So right at the right out of the box at this our current version um, does does not support natively handling those HL7 messages. Um, what we what typically happens is and you you do need a separate library or parser um, that will will go through and and pull the information that you want out of those uh, JSON or XML files. And there's there's libraries, there's many libraries out there. Like say, for instance, if you are uh, programming, if you're using Python, there's the Python HL7 library, uh, which you can use to, to parse your existing messages um, and pull the data that you want out and, and pass that through MQTT to the cloud or to um, to an an application uh, maybe that you use for remote monitoring. Um, so um, the answer is not not natively, but we can support uh, transmitting that HL7 data reliably for you. Perfect. Thank you, Ernest, and hopefully that addresses your question. Um, here's another one. With the critical nature of medical data, how does MQTT ensure the reliability and security of real-time data transmission between laboratory instruments and data management systems? Who would like to tackle that one? Uh, I'll take that one. All right, Brandon. Um, so I know with regard to reliability, did uh, touch on a few major points earlier, but just to revert back to that, you know, quality of service, keep alive, last will, those are all mechanisms that will help ensure the reliable transfer of your message and the receipt of it, uh, kind of drilling more into the security side of it to make sure that um, nothing's breached at rest or in transit. Um, MQTT does have client IDs included in uh, messages. So you're able to, at the application layer, be able to apply authentication or authorization uh, mechanisms to be able to, to, number one, confirm who... Uh, confirm identity, and then also be able to confirm their access and permission rights uh, to be able to interface and engage with this device. Um, other things outside of that are uh, 
things like uh, role-based access control, which I mentioned, uh, single sign-on, which is available in our current instance. Uh, but those, and you also have the option to do SSL TLS encryption uh, in transfer. So those are all different uh, practices and mechanisms we have to not only ensure reliability, but also security. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question. We have a very strict data privacy requirement. So we use a combination of private and public clouds. Does EMQX support multi-tenant private public cloud workflows? I'll take that one on, Rosemary. All right, thank you, Ernest. And uh, the answer is yes, yes. Um, as Brandon mentioned, you um, there are some extra things that you have to deal with if you're dealing with, let's say, multi-cloud and, um, but a lot of enterprises and a few of our customers choose to use, let's say, two public cloud um, providers so that uh, all of their eggs aren't in, in one basket, right? Um, so, so we do support uh, multi-cloud and also uh, multi-tenant to where, um, let's say you're running, uh, because of those strict data requirements, let's say you're running a private cloud in combination with, with public cloud, we can work with that infrastructure also. We have um, a very, uh, our, our broker is, is very easy to, to deploy in, in any public cloud, and uh, we um, we support uh, Kubernetes and, and containers. So um, if you have that type of environment where you can just push a container and you know launch that, um, we we have packages that are that are already loaded for you, uh, ready to go, ready to to deploy um, into again your your private, public, or or multi cloud. Great. Okay. Uh, next question. Does MQTT encryption impact each message or just the initial connection? Well, I, I'll i tackle that one also. And, and this is one that I, I wish um, uh, my our developer advocate was here just to uh, just to double check me, but I know he's he'll be watching this. Um, but um, typically the the overhead um, again, with uh, MQT messages is very low. So um, that the type of encryption is is chose is provided on the initial connection, right? And and that connection um, is is kept alive. And so um, it's it's very easy and and low profile as far as bandwidth um, to to just send the data back and forth from there versus uh, versus let's say with um, uh, TCP IP connection where we're we're establishing um, a, con a connection each time we want to send a message we have to establish a new connection and a new um, form of encryption that we'll be using and because we're that connection is is persistent the client and and server um, understand both understand already the the encryption that's that's being used so definitely one of the efficiencies and and advantages of of using MQTT. Perfect. Um, next question. Brandon, I think this one might be for you. Um, can you provide a real world example or case study where MQTT significantly improved the efficiency and responsiveness of a medical lab's operation? Yeah, um, there are two that immediately come to mind. Uh, I, I'll share one that is uh, more public in nature. Uh, we do have a customer, Simplica Corporation, which you know we will uh, more formally announce and speak to uh, in the near future. But you know it's a fairly simple use case. But essentially, what it was, they are a lab information management system uh, provider, and their bread and butter is creating uh, labware deployments. So where we play in that mix is we are really helping them more efficiently stream their data. Uh, to AWS. Um, they batch and collect and aggregate their data every five seconds. Um, so there is a lot of uh, demand and need there. So being able to streamline and make that more efficient, more lightweight, uh, was something that was incredibly valuable to them. Um, and I won't name the other uh, customer, but the reason why they're both uh, valuable and in other areas that I'd like to touch on is both were impacted by the deprecation of Google IoT Core which happened on August 16th this year. So um, 
they saw us as an effective replacement for that solution. As uh, Ernest mentioned, we we can deploy anywhere that you'd like to to host uh, your instance. So whether AWS, Azure, GCP, um, we were able to uh, let's so all of our uh, products, not all of our products, but our products are listed on the marketplace. So you can go to you know uh, GCP marketplace, you can go to Azure or AWS. And the good thing is if you were impacted by the deprecation and you still have credits left over that you haven't used, you can use those credits to purchase and buy into um, our system and be able to leverage that. And it's also important to note that we do integrate with uh, seamlessly with Google PubSub. So you're able to continue using what you already have in place. Don't have to you know, rebuild everything from scratch. So we tried to make it as easy as possible for you to continue operating as you were with um, Google IoT Core. Um, yeah. Sounds good. And yeah, thanks for, time. for mentioning that, uh, Brandon. I'm, before we go to the next question, Rosemary, I'm, I'd just like to expand on that because um, we in August, so it, it's on demand now. We we did a, a webinar talking about how how EM, EMQ as a company we can help you migrate those services from Google IoT Core to our EMQX broker, and we we are a, a premier Google partner, and so. Um, I'm I'm glad you highlighted that because not not just for the healthcare industry, we've helped many of our customers um, do that that migration uh, seamlessly and quickly, and and migrate a large number of devices. And so um, we're um, our team has been excellent about uh, getting the tech getting technical blogs out there, um, including step by step how how to migrate um, your your devices over. So look for that. All right. Oh, thanks, Ernest. Thank you. So it looks like we have time for one more question. And that question is, can MQTT be configured with end-to-end -end encryption? Who would like to take that one on? I All guess right. that <laughs> that would be that would be me. Um simple answer is is yes. Um and but I I'd like to take the opportunity to um, also mention that uh, with EMQX, with our, our broker, um, we we really make sure that you have uh, that the enterprise security that you're used to having. And so um, our latest version, um, as Brandon mentioned, um, supports uh, authentication and authorization, uh, meaning uh, verifying uh, who can access those resources um, and how they access those resources. Um, we also support uh, single sign-on, uh, so an OAuth. So um, it it again we we include um, that that enterprise level of of security that that you expect. Okay. Well, thank you again to you both. Uh, we are nearing the end of time for today, but I did want to go ahead and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with the team here at EMQ for additional questions, uh, you may want to take a quick picture of the current slide that is up. Um, feel free to go ahead and reach out. Uh, we will go ahead and also have a recording of this on our website. Um, and uh, if you are interested in having a replay, um, if you were happy with today's uh, webinar, I wanted to go ahead and also draw to your attention to next month's webinar, which takes place December 6th. We'll be talking about MQTT in the energy space. Um, this webinar will review real use cases of how MQTT clean energy systems can be monitored, controlled, and optimized, which leads to increased efficiency, a reduction of costs, as well as maintaining a more sustainable energy future. So with that, um, this concludes today's webinar. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and upcoming weekend. And thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.